All right. Um, so I guess I'll start by introducing myself um, on the panel first. So my name is Jill Fellows, um, and I am an academic podcaster now. <laughs> Um, so I do, I just did a season of a podcast over the summer called Gender, Sex, and Tech, Continuing the Conversation, and it looks at various technologies through an intersectional feminist lens. Um, I interview a bunch of scholars working um, in science and technology studies, in communications, in English and philosophy. Philosophy is my area, all that kind of stuff. So it's interdisciplinary. Um, I also still sort of do this other podcast that's a philosophical investigation of a video game that I love. <laughs> so it's a little more nerdy, a little more niche. It's been on hiatus a little bit, but I'm hoping to get back into that. Um, so that's a bit of background on like the scholarly podcasts that I do. Um, and I'm really excited to talk about what might make us podcast scholarly. What are the advantages of this, the challenges of this? academic freedom, university affiliation, all that kind of stuff. But I'll turn over for my other panelists to introduce themselves. Yeah, I guess I'll go. I'm uh, Dan Dissinger. Um, I'm a professor at University of Southern California in a writing program. Um, my two podcasts, like uh, the, I guess the one that would be considered the academic podcast would be the um, a podcast called Writing Remix, where we talk to scholars um, from all over the world, writers and um, teachers, even K through 12 teachers, which I've had a couple amazing K through 12 teaching conversations and um, and um, and entrepreneurs and and poets. It's like a whole gamut, but like it's been really quite amazing to kind of see that space, like and thinking about what makes it academic or what do I need for it to be academic? And then my other podcast is like, kind of like you, Jill, like where <laughs> it's more nerdy. It's about like nostalgia and pop culture. And my friend and I was a microbrewer on Long Island, like going back to our childhood stuff and go, is it still good or is it just nostalgic? But then we're actually started opening it up. I put a CFP out for people to be on that podcast. And I got scholars from all over the world that want to talk pop culture, they want to talk 90s culture, they want to talk nostalgia, and all of a sudden it became academic, or in my case, like it's part of this conversation now, possibly. Um, so it's been really fun to kind of see that even um, the, the horizon broadening on that podcast as well. So, uh, but I'm really looking forward to diving into this idea of like scholarly recognition and like what it makes to recognize that. But I'll just pass it over to our next panelist, Tegan. Hi, I'm Tegan. I am a part-time student now. I recently completed my master's and I'm taking a sort of a, a semi-break uh, in my studies before returning to grad school again. Um, so my podcast is the History and Philosophy of Physics podcast, and I started it a couple of years ago after I finished my undergrad degree and had a lot of time because it was 2020. Um, and it was what I, I wanted to study. I hadn't been able to study the subject in my undergrad. Um, I did study it for my master's, so it really kind of tied into the kind of research that I wanted to do and the kind of research that I did do um, during my master's. Um, yeah, so it kind of looked, my podcast has started uh, differently from a lot of history of physics podcasts in which I in that I went way, way back um, and have been looking at kind of the, the precursors to physics and a lot of the early influences, starting with the ancient Greeks. And I kind of skip around a little bit um, doing bonus episodes on more recent topics or just on less physics-y topics that I find really interesting because I can kind of do whatever I like with it and have a lot of the, the, the luxury of a podcast, of an independent podcast, um, that I can still do kind of scholarly research, but I can really incorporate all of the things that like I wouldn't be able to fit in to something like a like a research essay or a research paper. Um, yeah, so uh, starting have mainly covered like the ancient Greeks, um, and we'll be moving into like different areas, kind of the yeah less talked about aspects of the history and philosophy of physics. I think that's so interesting what you said about like maybe having some more freedom because I do feel like so okay um my gender sex and tech podcast I feel like I get why people say it's a scholarly podcast because the podcast accompanies a book that I co-edited with um, another colleague of mine the book went through a full academic peer review process 
And not everyone on the podcast, but a lot of the initial people I interviewed on the podcast were contributors to the book. So they, their research went through peer review. Right. Um, but my other podcast, I didn't want to call scholarly like, yeah, okay. I was taking philosophical ideas and I was applying them to the dragon age video games, which I absolutely love. (laughs) Um, and I could see that, yeah, it was philosophical, but it, yay, dragon age. (laughs) But it didn't, I don't know, it it didn't have all the trappings of like peer review and everything like the podcast that accompanies the book does. That meant that I and my co-host, Kira Thompson, felt like we had more freedom, that we could be more playful. Um, and so I do feel like sometimes it feels like there's a bit of tension between kind of having the freedom to say what I want to say or do what I want to do or have the guests I want to have on versus having like the trappings of like scholarly I don't know, peer review. And I'm wondering what my panelists think of that kind of thing. I mean, I would say like the reason I started a podcast was like to, to kind of allow myself that space to kind of go, okay, there are all these ways in which scholarship is viewed, the academic essay, the, the scholarly article, the voice that it it needs to be in. And I think also like part of like both of my you know, in, in as a doctoral student, being you know when I was studying at St. John's, it was like I was a literature student, uh, but at the same time we were able to take all these rhetoric and composition courses. And and the 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 discussion in rhetoric and comp is like, well, what is the academic essay, and how can we like redefine it and break it into pieces and make it more accessible and and understand that the essay itself is restrictive, specifically the academic essay. And then I'm studying you know, the beats and, and Kerouac, and they were like, well, if no one wants to read us, we're going to do it ourselves. We're going to create our own, like, zines. We're going to do our own readings. And also, we're going to record ourselves. Like, we're going to create our own archive. No one thinks it's this important. Well, we, we do. And so it's like, there's this attitude for me that comes from these two spaces and being a poet as well and kind of going, well, if no one's going to recognize me and, or if I have to continue to prove to people that this is, oh, that this is, like, viable information then it's like then I could just do it myself and this space allows me to do that and so like I find like it's all scholarly like I feel like my nostalgia test podcast is scholarly it's you know the writing remix is scholarly whether I have a scholar on or not like if I interview students it's scholarly like I just feel like that word is like so wrapped up in so much to kind of exclude more than include so Yeah, I totally agree. And I think um, I'm somewhat new to this space. So I attended the Humanities Podcast Network Symposium last year, very much as a newbie who had not really done anything. And now I have a season of gender, sex and tech out and, I, you know, I'm, I'm doing more stuff and I, but it is, it is kind of weird because I did hesitate to call some of my work scholarly. And I think it is because there are all these trappings of scholarly as being something that's exclusion. And so one of the things I really like about podcasting is that we get to kind of challenge that to some degree. But I will also say that like, it takes so much time to make a podcast. So there's somebody in the in the um, room here today who actually called me out earlier today because one of my podcasts has been on hiatus since June. <laughs> and that's because I couldn't make two at once. Um, So if I talk about making a podcast within academia, so I um, work at Douglas College, which is a teaching focused institution. So I have a high teaching load. Um, And I did actually, one thing that I think is cool about thinking about podcasts as scholarly is that I was able to get funding and time from my institution for making the gender, sex and tech podcast because I could make the case that this was open scholarship or open education, that the book that accompanies the podcast, the book you have to pay for. The book is through a publishing house, but the publishers were very supportive of me making this companion. And the companion podcast was open education, which my institution was all over, right? They were like, yes, we will help you do this. But I couldn't, I I still don't have time to sustain like two things at once. And so I'm trying to juggle this. So, you know, there is the time constraint too, that I find it very valuable and I find it very difficult to find the the time to do it. 
I'm so glad someone in the chat said that their podcast has been on hiatus since January. Thank you. Yeah, that's been, it's a very big struggle. Um, I always intend to get back to it, but um, it's, yeah, there's a lot going on. Um, has been a lot going on. So it happens. Yeah. It'll be returned to eventually. <laughs> Yeah, I, and oh, sorry, go ahead, Dan. Oh no, I just wanted to like say like you talking about you were talking about like university support and like that's really I, I I mean, so when I asked my university to help support or uh, even my program to kind of like for funding to help even to get like student inclusion and you know anything that can like lighten the load because I do have two podcasts as well and I have you know teaching writing is is. <laughs> very difficult considering you're always leaving feedback you're always reading papers you're doing a lot and I think like one thing when it comes to scholarly recognition and or university affiliation that I always find like hard especially with university affiliation is that will and I ask this question I'm like will my IP be able to come with me how much do I have to give up in terms of IP or in terms of my podcast and or how much can I not do now in terms of like have it like having a certain conversation even about the school that i'm i teach at that if something happens there and usc is always in the news so there's a lot to kind of discuss and i i think like they said well they kind of alluded to like yeah there'll be some that you have to give up and i'm not comfortable with that so to me it's like if if recognition scholastically means also me having to like relinquish part of the ip that i have then i'm okay with like going i don't have I, i'm don't want to have to prove that my podcast is to the to you know the ivory tower that it's useful like they need i feel like there's a more of a come to us attitude that has to happen considering that times are changing and the way in which scholastic conversations are changing are happening are changing and so like there needs to be a sense of understanding that and moving towards podcasting much more than podcasters having to kind of like continue to prove their like their their like value in the conversation yeah i think i have a lot of thoughts <laughs> i think it can be really hard um and especially for people who are so i like i said i'm at a teaching institution and that does change the dynamic right i don't have to publish to keep my job um i don't have to prove things have gone through peer review pretty much the the value of what I've I'm doing is is more recognized by my institution and that's in part because my institution isn't a research institution and so they can see oh this is open education that's really cool we support open education we're on board um, but I think I've seen a lot of conversations over the last couple of days and really in when talking about scholarly podcasting in general about people having this tension about that you need some people really, you need the recognition, right? You need it for, for your job or for, um, for making tenure or what have you. Um, and, and it's, I, I think things are changing. I mean, so in Canada, we have the Amplify Podcast Network, which is here in British Columbia. Um, and they're really kind of piloting in Canada, an idea of what it would look like to have a scholarly peer reviewed podcast if people wanted to go that route. And I think that's really, really cool. I know a couple of people who are involved in it, and I think it's amazing to have that option. I don't necessarily think we want all scholarly podcasts to go down that route, but I do think having that option is, is really, really valuable. And I'll also say from personal experience, like I belong to a few different philosophical societies, right? And now that they know that I have the skills, not like they're high skills, but I have the skills to make a podcast. <laughs> they're like could you make one for us and I'm like oh, I, I can't take on a third podcast <laughs> but like which is just to say that I think scholars are starting to really see the value in this um, for kind of public philosophy or public academia or even just for the members of a society to stay connected in between conferences and stuff and so I'm hoping that momentum will keep growing yeah I think it's it's such a it's a format that's so accessible um, and it's accessible, I think, in terms of making it, that it's fairly, yeah, straightforward once you learn how to do it, especially like get through the hurdles of sound editing and all of that, then it's pretty simple, apart from taking a considerable amount of time. 
Um, but once you can get something done and get something written and get something out, um, then it's it can be there and it doesn't have the long um, peer review process necessarily of like a paper or um, you don't have to wait until an annual conference to to get your like research and your work out and to get feedback as well. You can get very quick feedback from a very, very broad range of people. And it's, yeah, a lot very accessible for an audience as well. You don't have the paywalls of journals and you don't have to be a member of a university or an alumni of certain universities to be able to access um, these these materials and this um, and what people are talking about in their podcasts. So it's um, yeah, as as a format, it I think has a lot of advantages over the more traditional um, scholarly scholarly works. Uh, oh yeah, can I add to that? Like in terms of um, getting things out there more quickly, because the last podcast I did was on technology. Like the book that we wrote took two and a half years from initial conception to final publication. And we're writing about technology, right? And technology changes really quickly. Um, so a lot of the stuff in the book is already out of date and the book just came out this summer. <laughs> but having the ability to make a podcast that went along with it, like my publishers immediately saw how this was cool because it meant that I could go and return to all the scholars that were in the book and ask them like, well, what has happened to your research since then? And it was much more up to date. Um, the podcast, I, I coincided it. So it came out with the book so that you had the episodes all summer. And it was just kind of like a nice way to check in with people about like the things that had changed since they wrote their article in like early 2020, because <laughs> technology moves really fast. So I think there are some things where like academic publishing, because of how slow it is, <laughs> it doesn't always let us be as topical as we, we might want to be. Yeah, I mean, it even like makes me think about just even traditional publishing, right? Like if you write, a, like the difference even of writing a book for, you know, you know, that type of recognition academically versus me and, you know, in the terms of podcasting or just like that kind of like, like in a way like that that sort of like you know self-publishing or this stuff is you know even in like as a poet there were years where people didn't recognize a publication your poem published in an online journal as it even being worth anything and then all of a sudden that changed very like that changed after a few years where it's just like oh no like it it's that's valuable too like you're getting published and you know if you get published by you know some other high journal or whatever but there's also these online publications then that publication is weighs the same now right like or you know it depends so it seems like that the online space like the digital space or like the the kind of like garage band type like punk rock feel of like putting it together yourself and like getting like building a space that's not there um and creating scholarship that can be more exciting and more engaging kind of like it threatens the idea of like the slow moving type of traditional you know academia because it's also a faster way for for us to kind of also challenge that academia and and for more people to even hear that challenge as well so we've got a couple of comments in the chat that maybe we want to talk about. Um, one, the first one that I see is from, I think it's Avon. I hope I'm saying that correctly. I apologize if I'm not. Um, and the issue or the idea is that there are a bunch of podcasts that are easy to identify as scholarly um, equivalent to a journal or something like that. But there and there are a bunch of other podcasts that are clearly not. And then there's kind of this huge gray area, right? <laughs> of, um, so a bunch of them are hard to categorize or people's perceptions of them will differ. And I completely agree with this. Um, I don't know whether to think this is a strength or a weakness of podcasting or maybe both. Um, like I said, the first podcast I made about the Dragon Age video games, um, I hesitated to call scholarly. And then my friend, Brenna Clark Gray, who does a lot of academic podcasting, she told me and my co-host, no, th that's a scholarly podcast. And I was like, oh, well, if Brenna says it is, <laughs> um, but yeah, I do think that there is there is a big gray area where it's it's not in quite entirely clear. And I think I don't think that's unique to podcasting, though. I feel like public scholarship, scholarship that's intended for a wider audience 
I think that it often runs into that kind of gray area where it's hard to classify and people's perceptions will differ about exactly what you're doing. Um, I don't know. That's, that's my thought. Yeah, I think um, in, I would kind of class it, at least my podcast, which is aimed at a more general audience. It's kind of more similar to like a, um, a talk for a general audience or um, a paper written for an online magazine that's directed at a, at a general audience, even though it's still discussing like scholarly things and theories and um, historical theories or philosophical theories. It's not like written for academics. It's not written for publication in like a top academic journal. So I don't think it's like uh, will ever be regarded as the same, but at the same time, like it still is relevant for me as a scholar. Like it's something that um, I was asked about and talked about in my interviews for grad school. Um, and it was, uh, I've talked about it with like some of my research supervisors and how it was relevant to the research that I was doing, how I could like build off the research I already did in my podcast for my research essay, um, that kind of stuff. So it's like, it's in, yeah, more of a, a gray area where it's still like, it's scholarly, it's, um, and has like certain amount of value in it, but it's not the same as like a, a publication and whatever is a, like a really recognized journal in whatever field. Um, yeah, an odd gray area, but still like it still adds value and it still is something that like you can do that like represents your work and your value as a scholar, I think, um, your cap skills as a scholar. Um, it still kind of showcases that a bit in, in just a different way. It's kind of how I think about it. Yeah, I mean, it's, I would, Varsha, I, I would love to hear from you. Know, I can open, would you, do we mind opening it up too? Yeah, okay, great. Go ahead. Um, I'm loving, I, I have a question for Jill. I'm, I'm slightly dreading asking this question though, as well, <laughs> because I do want to know what happens in the peer review process of the podcast. Um, but the reason I'm dreading it is like everyone else is saying that what I am um, scared of is like, especially for like scholars of color, marginalized scholars, adjunct scholars, these um, forms were ways to present work without, uh, you know, gatekeeping. I mean, peer reviewing is gatekeeping so many yes, times. Yes, yes. Um, and so uh, I, like you were saying, Daniel, it's not about us reproducing those models. It's trying to challenge those models of say peer review or challenge those models of the, what is considered scholarly even. Uh, but I am curious, like <laughs> what did that entail? The peer review process of- the oh. So, okay, so there are two things. So, um, my my podcast gender sex and tech has not gone through peer review the book went through peer review um the podcast did not go through peer review <laughs> um and it's just hosted on an open access website i i did it all it's all me <laughs> um but i mentioned that there is um a movement in canada i think it's led by it is it's led by hannah mcgregor um from sfu and it's called the amplify podcast network and it's um, just piloting this year um, some peer reviewed podcasts. So I think there's three maybe that are signed up. So I haven't been through peer review. I don't know entirely what's involved. I know a couple of friends involved in this. All I've heard is that the peer review is a lot more collegial and collaborative than peer review tends to be. But that's that's all I know. I can't give you more insight at the moment. It's still very much a pilot project. It is not open yet for anybody to submit their podcast or anything like that. But I hear they're planning to launch more formally soon. So I'm, I'm afraid I can't answer your question. No, the collaborative aspect makes me slightly happier. <laughs> I feel like, and even like to, to your point too, Varsha, that like, my a really amazing podcaster who uh, has uh, the big rhetorical podcast, uh, Charles Woods, Dr. Charles Woods, he's it's an amazing podcast and he does a 
um, podcast carnival every year. And like, it's kind of like everyone sends an episode and then he, you know, puts it out there for like, it's kind of like a asynchronous symposium, so to say, right? So I, I submitted again, like I've been a part of it every year and, but the podcast I wanted to use was my comedy podcast because we had just done this amazing uh, conversation with um, this scholar uh, from uh, Chennai, India, who talked about um, 90s, American 90s cult, uh, culture and its impact on a post-liberalization India. And I was like, this was one of the best episodes we had. It's one of the most popular episodes we have, despite like everyone's, you know, despite everything like that's so funny on our podcast that episode like had the best first week ever and i'm in my head i'm like i'm sitting there with my friend who's a who owns a brewery he's not an academic he he's not a master's student he's a film student and he's a brewer and he had some of the best questions for her he had we had the best an amazing back and forth and now in my head i'm thinking what makes, and sometimes I'm thinking while I'm editing, I'm like, what makes this academic and what would it be considered academic? It, it, you know, and also then I'm like, but they, and I did put that podcast out on a CFP as an open CFP. And so scholars knew that it's a comedy podcast and I'm still getting requests to be on the show from all over the world. And it's really interesting to kind of see that the international audience wants to be on the podcast much more than, than like, I then I get especially for this one like then American scholars so it's really interesting like to kind of see like what even across lines of you know country and culture that people want, think that something is worth also being on to have a scholastic talk about you Are there other questions? We'd love to hear any questions or comments and anyone that wants to jump in on this. Um, I wanted to, I, I said something about this in the chat. Hello, hi. Um, realized I turned my camera on belatedly there. Um, I did, I did want to sort of raise again, um, which I, I raised in the chat in response to Avon's comment about like the differentiation between podcasts that are obviously scholar, scholarly, and ones that like aren't. Um, and I mean, I said something about this in the panel that I was in in the last blog that I, the podcast that I produce is not like very traditionally scholarly. We don't do a ton of research. We don't cite a ton of our sources. It's basically me and my friend shooting the shit. Um, and in, to some degree, like I think Avon is right to say that in a way us as scholars responding to media, which is what we do is like, a more original scholarly contribution in certain ways than just like presenting more traditional research in a different format, You one might say, but like nobody will take that on a grant application or whatever, <laughs> you know, like, and so as somebody, yeah, I'm a graduate student and like staring down the barrel of trying to convince people that the work that I do and have done is like worthwhile. And I'm just wondering what people think about how you, I don't know, sell, again, big air quotes, your work to your institutions or to like grant organizations or whatever, because like, I mean, for example, I tried to squeeze money out of the university that I attend to go to um, a conference, a conference that I was at with Avon actually to talk about my podcast and they did not deem the work to be sufficiently like a scholarly contribution that the university was willing to fund me to pay for the fee, like, you know, the fees that I paid to like get to the conference and stuff like that. So that's where I'm at struggling with like scholarly recognition for the work that I do. It's not that I don't think that the podcasting that I do is like, I mean, I think it's done a lot for me as a scholar, my development as a scholar and stuff like that. And I do think it's important work um, as like public public scholarship, public academia, but convincing people to give me money and convincing universities that that's like worth recognizing is not as easy, I guess. So I, I wonder what people have done about that and, and what they've 
how if they've encountered similar issues. Can I sorry, just very quickly react to that? I know that you were asking the panel, but just because you were responding a bit and both of you were to my comment, and I, I just wanted to make it clear when I say that there are scholar, there are podcasts that more obviously fall under public engagement or teaching and others that more obviously fall under traditional scholarly, uh, I don't actually, I, I'm not endorsing that division. Uh, I want to make that clear. I don't actually think that's a useful division which is why personally I've settled on public scholarship as my term because I don't like having a part of my CV that says community engagement or maybe I do but if it if I do the podcast doesn't go there I'm not I'm not that was a sort of a now I was in a bit of a privileged position in the past to be able to make that decision and then to have departments that that were okay with that but I put it under scholarship because even though our podcast very much kind of walks a line between like repackaging other scholarship and informing people about it. So much closer to my teaching. And then we also sometimes do uh, more well, something that might be con considered original research, you know, like it kind of does both. But I'm not, I'm not here to make that distinction. I don't want to make that distinction. I don't want to give universities, like I'm with Varsha a bit on that one. I don't want to give universities the that rubric where they can start being like this podcast is original scholarship and this podcast is community engagement like i i don't think that's a good road to go down so even though i understand the idea behind peer-reviewed podcasts and i'm not against it i'm also not completely comfortable with it because i think that's what it's doing it's saying okay we're going to hive these ones off as scholarship and the rest are going to be community engagement or whatever um and so you know, when you asked Julia, what have people done? I will just say that what I did, because I was more and more doing that rather than traditional publishing. And uh, I don't have a, I don't have a good, um, I can't tell you, I, I did get promoted on it, but then my university closed. So I can't tell you what, you know, <laughs> how it goes for careers. I don't think that was because I'm my podcast though. Um, but like I put it as scholarship and I, um, I, I put my, but I was in a position to do that and not have a lot of blowback to me um and i that's the other reason like why we got the cac to start that public the classical association of canada to start a public engagement a public scholarship award um and i think it's called public engagement which it wasn't my because i because i gave the idea and then they did it three years later with a different title but like i you know that's the kind of thing that i think is um the kind of initiative people can take like Jill, if you if you've got a philosophical organization that wants you to do scholarship, uh, public um, making a podcast, maybe like is there a quid pro quo where they can start a prize for public scholarship? <laughs> it doesn't have to have money; it just has to have a name, right? Because if you have a name and it goes on your CV, then obviously it's recognized, and that gives you like, right? Yeah. I don't know. It's hard for people in Julia's position to make that argument, but those who are already in the position might be able to to walk that forward. Anyway. I'll stop and let you guys talk. Yeah, um, I do think that um, associations may be able to help out a lot here, especially associations that are interested in doing this kind of thing. <laughs> um, and what was the other thing I was going to say? I mean, un so there's kind of a disappointing side of this which is that I do it again it it I'm in a privileged position oddly enough at a teaching institution because pretty much all of it is counted as scholarship at my institution and they don't really make a big distinction between peer-reviewed scholarship um open access scholarship one of my colleagues is doing a real this really amazing um philosophical collaboration with artists and installations and stuff and all of that is counting too and so but that's because we have a very different attitude towards scholarship because none of us are trying to go up for tenure or anything like that because none of that exists at my institution. <laughs> um, so part of it is, I think, kind of the institutional hierarchy that people are dealing with. And I do know friends who have podcasts who have tried to put it in scholarship when they were, say, going up for tenure and been told, no, no, we will recognize this work, but we're not putting it there <laughs> by, by their tenure root committees and things like that. And so I do think that it is, it's, it's hard for people in positions of, you know, grad school or early career or, um, um, sessional term certain, like it's, it, it is really something that has to be pushed on, pushed for by people who are in 
more secure positions, I think, and by our, we could definitely ask our, um, our associations, like our societies and associations to push for this as well. And I, to, to push for recognition that this, this, like this peer review divide is not, is not everything that's cracked up to be. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, I I agree. I mean, the th it, it, unfortunately, it does mean like trying to find the the faculty or the departments or programs on campus that are going to actually be supportive and can kind of also be the um, the the people that can actually help you find the other people on on a campus that are also going to help kind of like center that as scholarship and help you figure out how to even do it right. Like, I mean, I'm. Um, the writing program at USC is a teaching track position. So, but their teaching track position, their teaching track t uh, professors in an R1 university that literally just pretty much the tenure track faculty are like their favorite people. <laughs> it's there within um, salary compensation. It's there with professional development money that they give out every year to people. It's all very visible. And um, and I've had meetings with people and told them, you know, told them to their face about that. And I think what they what they consider teaching track is like, well, it's your contract is such and such percentage teaching and this little percentage of service. So even that sometimes in the teaching track position for me, I find it both an advantage and, and kind of a curse because in an advantage, no one really cares if I do this and, and they're just like, go right ahead. And I'm building a whole audience, I'm building a network, you know, this, you know, these symposiums and things like that. But at the same time, the effort that gets put into that, the recognition is capped at a certain level where it's just like, well, we can't, we can't really talk, we can't really, uh, you know, um, explain to the, to the provost and everyone that you deserve more because your contract says X, Y, and Z. So like there is like even in that with, even if I am being recognized the, there's a there's a recognition cap but at the same time i can also find the departments that are doing something similar to me and then hopefully make alliances with them and that's the only thing you know that that's the main thing i'm like learning now uh especially in an r1 like an r1 university is very hard to man maneuver in um but i would say my other university a doctoral student at St. John's University, they were really open. I saw someone do a dissertation defense that was all on turntables. They brought turntables in and used that as part of their dissertation defense. And I'm like, I've never seen anything like that in my entire life. Um, but they were, they're like an R2, R3. So like, they're like, let's do something interesting. Um, but R1, they, they thrive on that tradition because it's easier to kind of like recognize it. I also just want to pick up in the chat. Um, we have this idea that the discussion, this discussion is really illuminated how whether or not things get recognized is fairly dependent on how sympathetic your institution and maybe your deans and things like that are. Um, and I just wanted to highlight again something I said earlier, which is that I do think this is a problem for podcasting, but I don't think it's unique for podcasting. Um, so in philosophy, and maybe Tegan, you know this too, there's like all these books that are like, um, pop philosophy books, like philosophy of Harry Potter, philosophy of the Simpsons, philosophy of the, there's two different companies that publish all these pop philosophy books. Um, and these books, actually, I have a chapter in one of them. They do go through peer review, but there are a number of tenure committees that don't count publication in these books towards, <laughs> towards your, your scholarly contributions. Um, because they consider it to be, you know, popular philosophy or public philosophy and not scholarship. And so I think that, and this was also pointed out, I think with fine arts, it's further up in the chat than I can read right now. But this idea that there are lots of different areas of academia that are wrestling with this, um, with what gets recognized as scholarship. And another strategy might be trying to make alliances with some of these other areas as well. <laughs> Yeah, communication departments, like especially on uh, it, it really great places to go and seeing like smaller programs that also like are doing something um, 
that have, you know, and other affiliations on university and other spaces that, you know, might want a podcast. Like, and I think it's just the un, unfortunate thing right now when it comes to scholastic recognition is like, how much of what I can do can equal what they believe an article is. But I think the one thing about podcasting is this, that I love, is that I can always put out there when they kind of question what I do, that my podcast is reaching a far, has a far reaching international audience. And that in the first week, an episode sees more reads than an article. Like, and I can, and I think the thing is like being okay as podcasters to kind of flaunt that a bit when like, if it's questioned to kind of be like, well, how many times has this article been read and cited? How many times is this? Like, I know that my, my, this episode had X amount of downloads. I, here's all the interaction I get with this. Here's my like email list. Here's like, you know, and like, there are things that we might have to do that's extra to kind of, to kind of get that recognition but I mean, I'm starting to learn to do more of that in the last promotion cycle, even though it's like a teaching track promotion cycle was about doing that really kind of showing them like, you have to understand this. And then when I, you know, had a meeting to kind of tell them that it's important. I think that's the one thing is like scholastic recognition. People don't understand like how little sometimes an article does get read, but how amazing <laughs> valuable podcast is because you're getting real-time engagement um, and you can just show that with numbers. Can, can I actually just hop on top of that to say, so first of all, yes, put, met, like, put the metrics in, put them in your CV. I have the podcast. It has this many episodes. It's been going for this long. It has this many downloads on a regular basis. You know, some of its episodes have this many downloads, but also, um, this is a, a something I try to do myself and I try to ask other people to do. Ask on social media, has my podcast, like if you're looking for your CV, has my podcast been used in teaching? Has, have any of you used it? And please send me an email saying you've used it in teaching. Uh, so I will put that in my in my dossier, in my file. Um, have you have you recommended this to your students at any point, even like does, even if it wasn't in a, a class? Flip side of that, especially for those of us in more senior positions, have you used somebody's podcast in teaching? Send them an email, <laughs> tell them you did so, tell them you've recommended the, their podcast. That goes in your file, like that is to be able to say my, my and this, I try to do the same thing with journal articles, frankly, because that's the kind of thing that never, you don't get metrics on how many times your article's been used in, in a class that if it's not cited, it doesn't turn up. So I try to do, tell people about that too. But at least if it's in a journal already, you've already got some credit for it. So it's not as big a deal. But with the podcast, that is a way of saying, look, this is scholarship. It was used in a class. What do we use in classes for teaching? We use scholarship. <laughs> if, if other people's material being used in a class counts for theirs to be scholarly, then mine is. Um, and that, I think, is a big piece of it. Yeah. If and I that's can something also... we can do individually for to help yeah. our colleagues, right? Let people know. I, th I think to also their stuff in a class and then tell them. <laughs> I think also we can, and, and this depends on your podcast, but there are a lot of pedagogical podcasts out there too. So even if you don't like use the podcast in the classroom, if you right. got an idea of how to structure your class from a pedagogical podcast, right. Or from an ed, an, uh, uh, an ed tech podcast or something like that, like letting people know, cause like yeah, that's just another, like, just because the podcast isn't used in the classroom doesn't mean you're not using the podcast to influence how you're teaching, right? Um, we've got another hand up. Oh, uh, Farsha. Hi. Hi, I'm just so excited about everything that's being said here, especially the fact that, you know, uh, recognition can take different forms and to document that recognition. I also feel like we really need in academia to be thinking beyond peer review. Um, I mean, how do we decide markers of quality beyond peer review? And one of this is, of course, like, you know, if somebody's used it in teaching or to get an idea, but are there more? Can we say, for example, demonstrate that a marker of quality is that uh, this particular podcast is much more diverse in its, uh, say, you know, engagements or creating new publics and things like that. So I think we really need to also help academia, I think, think about 
markers of quality that are not peer review, but are something else. Yeah, if I can jump off that too, one of the things I really like is that podcasting allows you to speak in a different voice from how we're often trained to write the peer reviewed academic essay in our various disciplines. And that this often allows, I don't know, in my own experience using podcasts in teaching, I think it reaches my students in a different way, right? Because they can hear things that sound more authentic or that sometimes sound more like themselves. So people are doing up speak or people are speaking with different regional accents or there's a dog barking in the background or there's a baby crying in the background. And it just, it sounds like life um, in a way that often our academic papers don't. And so when we're thinking about um, inclusion and diversity, having, you know, like your voice and your accent are such an important part of like your identity and having people being able to speak that way, I think, is also a really important marker of the scholarly importance of podcasting, so to speak. I think that's such a fabulous point. Like, that is why I, you know, why do I use podcasts? Well, often the material is findable in another context, but you know, it's more accessible. It's all the things we say that podcasting is when we talk about it. And one of those things, and also it's accessible in a format that students are already used to, you know, there's good value for, of course, there's good reasons for making them read scholarship in other forms too. Like it's not the only thing I use, but uh, if there's stuff I want to get across and it lets them hear, it opens up the possibilities that they could do such scholarship themselves because they can hear somebody who doesn't sound as far off as a fully polished, published scholarly article does, right? Like that doesn't feel like something they can achieve. But Julia, please don't take this the wrong way. Julia and her friend talking a little bit of sort of off the cuff from their expertise, but without uh, a whole lot of, of like jargon about um, a Percy Jackson book or whatever they can do that or at least they can imagine themselves getting to the point where they can do that and that's hugely valuable in the classroom yeah, yeah. and it it puts like emotion back in mm. yeah yeah i mean we like i don't know that i don't know that i would ever use my my podcast for my own teaching because what i produce is not meant to be a teaching resource exactly what it's meant to be is i mean like a lot of reception work I think a lot of the import of it is about connecting ancient material to modern material and making it understandable and relatable for students and for the general public and making people feel like they can engage in a knowledgeable way with the media that they consume and that they can be thoughtful and and because like we that's what we're doing and we do it in a very off-the-cuff way and I, I do think that that is important in a scholarly um, context as well, that like students just engage more in classes when they are able to understand, like when they can really connect to the material at hand. And so, like, as I said, I don't know that I would necessarily use my podcast as a teaching tool, but I certainly think that podcasts like mine should exist in the academic sphere and should be available to students as like a thing, a way for them to engage, but also just for anybody and for academics to have access to them and to be able to engage on that level. Because like, why are we doing this if it's not fun? <laughs> like I, I'm in my field because I love it and I enjoy it and I want to talk about it. I think you totally could. So, okay. So the one that I do with my friend Kira, where we talk about the Dragon Age games and we apply philosophical theories, I Which thought was just- I do need the title of. I, <laughs> it's I called need Andraste's to... Godfly, but it is on hiatus. Okay. Um, I know, but I, please, it will make me insane. I can already tell. I muted myself. Sorry. But um, I thought it was just kind of a fun thing that Kira and I were doing and that it was mostly for Dragon Age fans and then I found out that there were philosophers listening to it who didn't know the Dragon Age stuff <laughs> and so we had to kind of rethink how we were presenting things but also my 
colleague, when she found that out, my co-host, she started using one of the episodes in her classroom as an example of applying ethical theory. And she created a whole assignment around it so that her students would apply ethical theory to you know, some kind of fiction that they love, because sometimes it's easier to apply ethical theory to a fictional world as a place to start, because you can kind of get all the facts that exist about a fictional moral dilemma in a way you can't necessarily with a real world one. And so it it was never intended as a teaching thing. And it kind of crept into my colleague's syllabus um, as a teaching tool. And so I think sometimes we can surprise ourselves about where these things can go. I just think we swear too much, but fair enough. That's the good thing about teaching adults, at least in Canada. I don't care about giving them sweary stuff. I might not play it in the class, but I'm like, you are all over 18. You can listen to sweary stuff. You can choose to do so. One of the podcasts I like to recommend to my students is Myths Your, Pod Myths Your Teacher Hated, which always makes me feel like, wait, I don't. Um, but uh, where he, it's like the most not safe for work approach to retelling myths from around the world. And I'm always like, you can do it. You guys are adults. You decide whether you want to hear those words or not. <laughs> Tegan, we have a question in the chat for you, I think. Oh, it's from Avon. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess, uh, I mean, I'm coming from a much, like a much earlier career level. Um, so I'm not really thinking about teaching yet, even though I probably will be in like a year or two. Um, but yeah, it, I've mainly used my podcast so far as like evidence of research experience, which my podcast is a very research based podcast. So I'm fortunate in being able to do that. Um, but that's kind of, yeah, how I, how I talked about it and how I presented it. Um, uh, the reactions, yeah, they were pretty positive. I mean, it's good, like coming out of undergrad to have anything and especially to have had a podcast that you were doing regularly for a year. Um, that was really, really beneficial. And to have something that's so specific when I wanted to, um, I was applying, I did my master's at Cambridge in the history and philosophy of science and medicine. And so I was applying saying wanting to do the philosophy of physics, which is such a very, very small field. And it's not something that you can study in most universities in the world. Um, so having had the like independence to like go and research that on, on my own and to, to start and like create something and be writing about something talking about things in this field even though like I hadn't been trained in it but like I had been trained in like the separate areas of philosophy and physics and history um so kind of having that showing that initiative and just like um yeah preliminary kind of scholarliness um <laughs> whatever in in the field I think it was um good and was beneficial I think it helped uh, get me admitted because um, I didn't have any publications I didn't have I mean I had like solid grades very good grades generally and like some other conference presentations and a lot of community engagement stuff in science I did a lot of stuff for women in STEM um, so I think it was just one of the things that helped but it was definitely I think um, showed was evidence of like just my interest in the area to begin with, which is just good to have some kind of material evidence of that, um, especially if you're moving into something that like you didn't have a degree in, or you had never taken a class in this specific field or subfield before, but you are now suddenly trying to say like you want to do research in this for a year or for a longer period of time. Um, so having that as like evidence for you've had an interest in this for longer than a month or however long it took you to put together an application or whatever. It's just that more, yeah, material evidence that this is like something that you really are, are interested in, an area that you're interested in. So I do think it was helpful, but I don't know for sure. I don't have access to the, the admissions committee. Um, I just know like the yeah, the people I spoke to, like, they were excited about it. Um, the guy who interviewed me was going to be uh, my PhD supervisor. I wasn't able to do the PhD for different reasons, um, but he was definitely, like, always interested in it and, like, thought it was really, really great and was excited to, like, hear about it and hear more about it and work with me ultimately for a PhD, so...
Um, can I tag on to Tegan talking about um, grad acceptance stuff? So I didn't have an interview um, process in part because I was accepted in 2021 and they were still not doing any kind of in-person anything. Um, but I did talk about my podcasting in my like personal statement. Um, and the department has since, again, like, I don't know how much it contributed. I don't have access to the, you know, the admissions committee, but um, I mean, I do, there's like six profs in the department. I know who's on the admissions committee. I could ask them, but I'm like, I'm not willing to put myself through that conversation. However, <laughs> um, I have had profs who I know are on the admissions committee mentioned to me that like, um, who I know are interested in podcasting as like an academic tool and also who have sort of brought it up to me as like, hey, would you be willing to, for example, give a presentation, like a skills presentation in the department and talk about podcasting? And um, because I, I know that like increasingly, certainly in my department, there's a lot of interest in like public academia, outreach, alternative, um, like alt act stuff. Like there's a lot of awareness. I mean, and Avon can attest to this as well. I think like our field is very small and there's not a lot of jobs. And so grad programs, I mean, my grad program, thankfully, is very like, there's not a lot of jobs, do other stuff, um, and wants to provide us training in other stuff that we might do. And I think that's common in the humanities broadly. Um, and so there, there is keen interest in the department in like, how do we podcast? Like what, how do people podcast with, is humanities podcasting an avenue that we can, you know, send students towards? Is this a skill that we can give people that will be useful to them? Stuff like that. Um, so they did seem to take an interest in my podcasting as like a scholarly avenue. Um, but I don't know how much it played in as opposed to other stuff, you know. I, I mean, I just want to like say, like going back to something about this, you know, about scholarship, like I just, anytime I think about like podcasting and kind of is it viable or is this a skill we could teach students or whatever and, and bring it in. I'm always thinking about, you know, and I wrote in chat, like, you know, things that, about like Bell Hooks and Paulo Freire said about how like, you know, especially Bell Hooks where like in teaching the transgress, talking about how much academia dehumanizes like the instructor and the student. That like, it's all up in the mind. It's like the idea to sever us from the body or you know as she put the mind body spirit connection to sever the body and the spirit from the mind and only stay up here that it's not it has no it doesn't matter if like you are a functioning person as long as your brain works literally and that's what academia cares about right what i found with podcasting is like how much more of it like becomes the becomes humanistic and how I've cried on my podcast. I've had people, guests have cried on my podcast. We've gone going deep into things and, and have opened up to each other and the audience. We've had conversations where it isn't just about the brain, but it is about being, you know, in a, a dialogue that's peaceful. You know, as Frere said, that authentic dialogue can only happen with like people have a, an authentic love for each other and the world around them. And I feel like in podcasting, like a good episode has that. You have that like type of authentic need, like respect or, you know, as he would say, love for like being in that space and to have that exchange. That it's not just like for someone or about them, but with. And I feel like that's what podcasting does that like traditional academia does not consider most of not most of the time. That was awesome, Daniel, like a new model of scholarship. We'll just throw that out at the end. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, Avon, you put that in there. Okay, good, good. <laughs> Yeah, definitely everyone leave our leave feedback. We, you know, would love to, I think even put the link to the form and also to the gather space um, if you want to continue this conversation. But I don't know. Thank you so much. This has been great. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Tegan. <laughs> Thank you. And this concludes the symposium. So yeah, thanks to everyone it who was involved the whole for the symposium. whole two days or who was able to come for any parts of it. Really, really appreciate <laughs> everyone who was able to come by.
Yeah. I feel like there should be some sort of music right now. It's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this was awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thank I will you. be back next so, year. Yes. yes. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you all. We have claps in lieu of music. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you.